Welcome everyone, uh, and thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Kondalani. I'm with Hawaii Children's Action Network, um, also from H. Canner, Zoe, and, and Deb uh, here on video. Um, thank you for joining us for our Keiki Talk tonight, uh, which is called um, How to Help Your Kids uh, Heal from Racism. Um, it's an important topic, and we're so glad to have two incredible community leaders and, and really experts um, to learn from and talk with tonight, uh, Dr. Kukaha Kalau and Elizabetta Ale Maliata. Uh, both of them are winners of our uh, H. Can Champions for Children Award actually in 2020 and 2021. So we're really thrilled to be able to keep working with them this evening. Uh, Dr. Kukaha Kalau has been involved in Hawaiian education and research for over 30 years uh, and is currently executive director of Ku Akanaka, as you can see in her background. Um, and Elizabeth's career has been dedicated to the preservation and propagation of Samoan language and culture. And she is currently the executive director and founder of the Le Fatuao Samoan Language Center. Um, so we're really thrilled uh, to be able to have them both tonight. Thank you. Thank you both for joining us. So it's I'm, our pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to get us started um, just with, uh, with a question for both of you. Um, and I would like to tell our attendees, if you have any questions along the way, please um, go ahead and put it in the chat, in the Q&A, uh, raise your hand, whatever is easiest for you. And we'll definitely try and get to all of your questions. Uh, but for, for both of our panelists to get started, um, what was the first time you remember an adult, a parent or a teacher or someone else? What was the first time you remember an adult talking to you about race? Well, I, I, part of it I remember and part of it I was told by, by my mother, but I was about three years old and my mother is Caucasian. She's pure German. My father's Hawaiian and he's a Hawaiian. He was a Hawaiian jazz musician. So we had this uh, African percussion player living with us. And um, that was my uncle, you know? So if my mom was white, my dad was brown, my uncle was black, that made perfect sense to me, right? I, I didn't see anything wrong with that. I didn't, I didn't think there was anything abnormal about that, even though we lived at that time in, in Cologne in Germany. For everybody else, it was extremely abnormal. And so um, the, the kids actually teased my uncle. They said, oh, does he have a tail, blah, blah, blah. And I, I basically got into a fist fight at three years old with those kids, you know, because how do they dare they insult my uncle? And so then when I got home and my mother found out about it, you know, she sat me down and she tried to explain, yes, your mom is white, your daddy is brown and your uncle is black. And some people have a problem with that kind of thing. So that's kind of how, how she tried to explain. There's nothing wrong with it. It's all perfectly fine. It's all good, you know, from her perspective. But she wanted me to know that not everybody had that kind of a situation that in most cases, both parents were white or both parents were black or both parents were brown, you know, to have multiple, and in our case, three colors, even though Uncle Pete wasn't, you know, uh, related to us by blood, as far as we were concerned, that was our uncle, um, that there was people that had issues with that. And that was the first time, you know, that I kind of realized that that what, what was going on in my family wasn't quite normal, right? it wasn't the norm. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's the first recollection I have of, of a race issue, kind of. Oh, you're, you're muted, Elizabetta. Well, I grew up in a family where um, we are so diverse. And in being around with my grandparents, they were ministers of the Methodist church. So um, in the church, you see, um, you know, people of color, different um, of ethnicities as well that they would enter. So, you know, I think that's where it started for me because I had to ask the question and my grandparents were very, they used um, 
you know, the Bible as a way to, as a tool to help me understand. And even with my brother, um, I think, you know, at the earlier ages where uh, my summer was always around my grandparents and my grandfather is really fair. Uh, you know, even at my mother's side, my grandfather is also really fair. And, you know, we heard that um, they have mixed Samoan and German and, and all of that, you know, so, but my grandmother was dark. So at times there were conversations around our home where we discuss skin color, but it was never at a point where we had to, to um, feel um, different, but it was more um, a way to identify uh, who's around us. So in, in our family, um, evening, evening um, session is always a, a, a family time where everyone comes together. So when we bring up you know, issues of, of race where someone went against, you know, um, talk about racism in, in the community or the family, that is our space. That was always our space of discussion of discussion until the time I um, I married my husband and I have children. I noticed that a lot of my <laughs> cousins are intermarried and they all married Hawaiians. They, uh, they even married um, Tongans and different nationality, different ethnic backgrounds. So from there, when we have our family reunion, you know there's a lot of discussions around that issue of race. But at the same time, we've created a space where our family would come together and talk about it. I think that was a very important thing as part of my upbringing as um, a person in, you know, in our Samoan community. So um, I try my best to share some of that with my children. Yes. <sighs> Now, now, you mentioned for the most part, um, you know, you talked about race and, you know, it was part of your life, but you weren't made to feel different about your race for the most part. But growing up to, to either of you, did, were there any early experiences like that of now what you now know as racism or, or bias that you faced or, you know, you talked about as a family? Yeah, for, for me, definitely. Uh, for my father, this was in the 60s in Europe. I in Germany specifically, um, definitely there was very little color <laughs> at that time period, any, any color except for white. Um, and so there was definitely, um, some of it was subtle and some of it was overt. So for example, he couldn't even enter my auntie's house because of no, you know, because he was brown, you know, and that kind of, it, it just really didn't sit well with me, you know, and even though we looked relatively fair, last name Kahakalao, you know, you really, I mean, no matter what you do, that's not German, no matter which way you cut it, you know, so we also, you know, experience where, you know, people just looked at us and go, oh, these poor worms, <laughs> kind of expressions, you know, these poor children, you know, and the, and the only thing that made us poor, in, you know, in there was this mixed ancestry, you know, just not quite up to par, to their standards and to their things. So we definitely experienced it um, growing up in Europe, um, you know, when we were young. And then when we came home again, also, you know, because then we were so fair. At that time, there weren't that many blue-eyed Hawaiians around either. Now we have lots of blue-eyed Hawaiians, but during my time, that was not a, a common thing either, right? And then it was like, oh, you was adopted or whatever, you know, kind of thing. And, and then you know being called howless on the other side again too right from the from the from, from the hawaiian side also um and not always easy i i you know by that time i was already um secure enough i think in who i was that it didn't bother me per se but um it still happens and we my daughter and i were actually just discussing that you know uh when 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 she had a conversation with some of her friends about racism um, and it was primarily first just Hawaiians saying how they were being discriminated against and whatever. And then my daughter saying, well, because she's also relatively fair, 
and in and in her case, her mom and her dad are Hawaiian, and she speaks Hawaiian, she was raised Hawaiian. Uh, but where people that are maybe Filipino or Puerto Rican and have like a little bit of Hawaiian, a lot less than she does, but because they're brown, you know, they calling her Haole and she going, hey, you know, that you know, so so these issues they are they're a way of life. I think um, in you know whether we and I think it's probably everywhere in the world that people who are just different um, will have experiences where they are treated also different, um, you know, because of the color of their skin and no other reason. So I think it's something that is that is a reality no matter where we go in the world. Yeah, and I can say that <laughs> this is so true that no one is immune from facing discrimination and prejudice and all of that. Um, for my experiences, um, you know, when I was young, I grew up in a family where my grandfather was the paramount chief of the village where in Savai, I remember, um, you know, I was around a lot of white, um, you know, anthropologists that were there and usually the highest person in the village or the highest chief in the village would would be the host for some of these, um, for some of the, uh, you know, scholars that are coming to the island of Sabai, which is the big island where most of my life I grew up um, as a young someone girl in it, around my grandparents. So, as you know, in 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 our family, since my grandparents had to cater to some of these guests, and they are only allowed to stay with my grandpa. Um, we were around, uh, you know, some of them that it really made us understand that um, the diversity, the, the differences in, in us. I have some of my cousins that are really white, that, you know, that the, the, the skin color does stand out, especially when you come together as a family. So, of course, you're in a Samoan community where everyone is brown. So when you have a family with a mixed race ra ratio, you you feel in, you know that everyone is included, everyone is the same, and we we understand how to handle those situations when when um, when there is um, talk about you know those differences. So you know um, that was as a young girl. So when I moved here in Hawaii, I was very um, shocked to the, you know, that I worked at 7-Eleven as, as a part job, well, part-time job while I was studying at the University of Hawaii. And someone mistakenly said that I'm Hawaiian. Um, for me, <laughs> I was so proud. I'm saying, oh, really? <laughs> um, and I think I, I, when I say I was proud because I'm here at the host um, country, which is Hawaii. Hawaii is the land that I'm at and you know I respect that and to be included in that perspective to be seen as someone like others I I you know I felt special but in the back of my mind I, I know I'm someone and I'm around Hawaiian community uh, members so when someone um, would mistakenly say that I'm Hawaiian or speak Hawaiian to me, you know, I would respectfully say <laughs> I'm Samoan. I can understand some of the words that you say because my language is almost as similar as yours. So, um, you know, there are times I was mistaken to be Tongan. So you can see that, you know, you know the, the environment or the community that we live, we are so ethnically diverse that as uh, a member of the community, we have to understand how to respect or how to respond to some of those um, comments. So uh, I'm so happy to, um, you know, to be part of this conversation because, you know, it's something that we cannot brush off or, you know, just push aside very important to um, have this dialogue. Yes, <laughs> thank you. 
Um, so you now, now both of you um, work with kids, students, um, you know, different ages, but you know, in your day-to-day -day work or, or certainly you have in, throughout your career. Um, how do you hear about them talking about race and racism um, in your experience? Well, a lot of times, you know, kids say and act the way they are taught at home, right? So a lot of times you can, by their expressions, you know what's going on at home as far as attitudes towards another race, for example, right? So if they come in with, with the blankety blank and then whatever um, next ethnicity or nationality or race it is, you know, you know, they didn't come up with that themselves, right? That's something that they heard somewhere else, right? And most times it's what they hear at home, right? And so I think that's kind of what one of the one of the parts, you know, that that um, is really hard because you can't blame the kids for repeating what they heard their father and their mother say, right? Kind of that's that's a natural thing that kids do. And so then, you know, to really work with them and to make them understand without really dissing their mother and their father, right? Because you don't want to say your father and your mother are blankety blanks because then we're right in the, in the, in the same kind of a, a situation again, you know, but, but just saying, you know, there's another way of looking at that, right? You know, um, there are others, uh, you know, uh, um, that come from whatever the, the race or the ethnicity or the background that they just kind of, you know, diss or, or put down or, or you know, made, made less than them um and there are wonderful people in 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 that group you know and then trying to look at people that are in their class and say look so and so he's part this and that and isn't he your friend you know so just for you to say that all oh, and then whether we say haole or popolo or samoy or something it doesn't matter filipino Puerto Rican, it doesn't matter who they this you know but the idea of showing them that there's no such thing that all people of whatever ethnicity or race or background are bad, right? Um, so then, then the idea is always to, to show them examples, whether they're in their own class or whether it's teachers at the school or people that they know that are of whatever background it was that they felt was whatever, you know, kind of thing, and show them that those are nice people, that they're loving people, that they're caring people, and that they have a relationship with them. And why would they not want to have a relationship with that wonderful person just because they are, you know, whatever it was that that they, you know, that they kind of um, thought was less than, you know, or um, or just bad. You know? So I think that's a really important part is that we that we don't start doing the same thing by then, you know, putting down their parents where even though we know clearly that's where they heard it from, right? And then really getting to that point where we can make, where, where we instill this idea that everybody has aloha, you know, that everybody, that there's good and bad people everywhere and then bringing that message back home again, right? Because I think the parents and grandparents generation of today's children, you know, are, I can certainly speak for Hawaiians, are suffering from immense historic and cultural trauma, right? And having been put down for so long, you know, as being less than, you know, um, being stupid, being lazy, you know, being all of those, uh, not motivated, you know, uh, and, and those expectations of us, many of us started to believe all of all these things that we were brainwashed into supposedly being. And so, um, and nobody helped them out, right? There was there was no talks about racism. There was no talks about historic trauma when I was young or when my father was young. You know that it didn't exist. So um, now that we are talking about it, I think it really we have to also not just help the kids, but also help the kids to help their parents and help their grandparents to overcome some of these things that just were automatic because of the time that they were living in. Well, we, we know that home is, uh, is always the first classroom for, for everyone. And I think it's very important for all of us to, to know the importance of, of, of building that space. And, you know, 
providing a positive home space is very crucial, very important. Um, you know, let's say for example, my, my family, when we transitioned from Samoa to here, uh, we never expected we're going to live in Hawaii and raise our, our five children. <laughs> so for me as a parent, I always have to reflect on the positive atmosphere or the community that I was raised by when I was um, in, in Samoa. Um, my summer was always filled with um, excitement to travel to the big island of Savai, which is the independent state, uh, independent nation. My parents lived in, Sa in American Samoa and summer was always in the independent nation to go visit my grandparents. So when you think about that positive environment and the, the healthy, the, uh, the, the wellness of building that spiritual wellness in the child, you want to you know, promote or you know, even continue to raise the next generation to have that spiritual wellness in their mind, in their soul, in their hearts as well. So when I raised my children here in the state of Hawaii, I knew I'm not living in an immersed society where someone is spoken, where someone culture is practiced all the time. I know when they exit that door in my house, they're exposed to many diverse things in this world. So what can I do in order to equip my children so that when they exit the door, they know what to do, that they are well equipped and they have that um, I would say they, they, they know what to, the tools of, of, of how to prevent themselves from being part of something that is not, you know, not good. So um, I, you know, when I had the kids, of course I had my mom, <laughs> they, I, I wanted my parents to be around. I wanted my aunties to be around and uncles to be around so that they have they, they are raised around um, family members that I trusted and those that will provide that upbringing. Um, one of the things that I had to um, instill in my family is, is um, building a tradition. And that tradition was something that I, I had to transfer from my upbringing as a young person in Samoa moving here in Hawaii. Um, and that tradition was every seven o'clock in the evening or sometimes at six o'clock in the evening is family time. And we call that family time Lotu of Yafi. Every Samoan family knows and understands what Lotu of Yafi is. This is the evening time to meditate, the evening time where you drop everything and you're down in the living room. And that is where we come together and pray and talk. Um, when we have family time, um, we try our best not to be the, you know, you know, not the adult to dominate the whole space, but provide our children the opportunity to have that voice. So we would assign the children to have tasks, you know, to lead our family time. And, you know, so when my children grew up, you know, they grew up with that upbringing that, you know, that half an hour or 15 minutes during the day is very important. When you build that um, family tradition in your space, in the family, um, it helps create that positiveness of, of the, the, the wellness, the spiritual wellness. We talk about physical, we talk about social wellness, we talk about, you know, even academic development, but have we ever thought about spirit, their spirit of wellness? It's very important, with, which covers their mental, uh, you know, their mental health. So at times you can easily, easily tell when a child is down. When there is a problem in school or even with a friend or someone, you could tell when they 
they pray or when they share with us. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, when they pray, they're safe. They can say whatever. Dear Lord, my mom was so mean with me today. So um, that safe space, that safe that openness that you have with your children to make them understand that they are in this safe space where they can um, say anything. But even as a parent, you train yourself to, to, um, to feel, to, to be open-minded with the child. I know, and <laughs> I was raised in a family where, where um, my, you know, where we're told that you're not allowed to speak. When adults speaks, you are to listen. Young ones, you're supposed to, to listen. So some of those, um, you know, upbringing or things that you learned in your family, when you move to a different society, a different community, you want to ensure that there is adjustment and you understand what you know what you need to do as a parent. So that was very helpful. So even developing Lefetuau Sam One Language Center, my children knew how important that was, learning their language and even their culture to actually know their identity. Um, that really instilled in the minds of my children to understand that it's part of their life. It's an important part of their life to learn about their identity to learn about their culture and their language. Of course, they spent eight hours in the public classroom, public school classroom. And the rest of the hours and the rest of the time, they're with us and even during the weekends. So when you think about it, when you think about that, how can we help our kids understand that, they, um, that they're living in a, a very diverse society what, where their identity is also very important to not only to them and even to others, okay? Sometimes we may think as classroom teachers that we are well equipped with the skills of, of teaching race, you know, issues of racism in the classroom. Sometimes we make mistakes as as classroom teachers, because in our, in our mind, we don't think about it. But, you know, when we are well-trained, when we think about situations like that, we, we um, can help ourselves to become better. So that's pretty much the way um, I, I, I would respond to, you know, ways to prevent the issue of racism in my family. You know, developing that tradition in, in, the, in the family. Of course, Ku Kakalao, I love seeing Kakalao's um, children in the farm. That is something that I really miss. So where do, I, where do I take my children since we don't have a farm? Of course, when we had Lefituau, I have to identify and find partners or people with farms to take the children because when our grandparents are around, they talk about farm. <laughs> but do our children understand there is a farm? I mean, because there's no farm at an apartment. But you provide, you, you, you create the resources or develop some partnership and uh, places, space to take the children and expose them. So I, I always look forward to go to Ku's, um, a place to look at YPO because you know it's it's really good. It's an environment where you feel that spiritual wellness in yourself to relax yourself and be connected with the land, be connected with you know nature, something that we need. Yeah. It sounds like what you're saying is um, you know a big part of building up their resilience to you know, the racism or whatever they might experience outside of the house is building up a positive cultural identity, a strong, you know, sense of self and culture um, from the family. 
Um, and you also talked about, um, you said, you know, you kind of had a toolkit for, for doing that. Um, I'm wondering what else is in the toolkit and, and Ku, if you also have, you know, your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, well, I think there's there's some multiple things. I think the first part, like uh, I couldn't agree with Peta more, is from very young on to make our children and especially those that are come from mixed backgrounds. But I think even if you have the same, you know, ethnicities, the same race, whatever, um, that uh, who you are, you know, as that person, as that, as that. Hawaiian as that mixed person, as that Samoan person, as that black person, white person, it really doesn't matter. And, and uh, cultivating a sense of pride, not haughtiness, you know, not arrogance or anything like that, but just pride in who you are, you know. Um, our ancestors in our Hawaiian ancestors said, lehu lehu a mano mano ka ikena akawai. Great and numerous is the knowledge of the Hawaiians. Well, None of us knew that growing up, you know, we were all told Hawaiians were stupid and lazy and blah, blah, blah kind of a thing, right? So by them knowing their culture, knowing these proverbs that were passed down for thousands of years from one generation to the next, knowing how ingenious their ancestors were, whether it was navigating, you know, thousands of miles of open ocean, whether it was uh, observing the environment uh, so that they could predict what was happening, whether it was farming, fishing, uh, creating all kinds of beautiful art, uh, taking care of the land, whatever it was. And in whatever culture, I'm speaking from my Hawaiian culture now, um, you know, and, and the more our kids learn that from very young on, the more they can feel secure in who they are. My youngest, my oldest daughter, her first sentence, and this is during that she was born in 93. This was when Bulaia was around and you would hear, Hawaiian, right? And some of you might remember that. Um, so her first sentence was Mama Hawaiian, Papa Hawaiian, Iini Hawaiian, right? There was no identity crisis, you know. At that same time, my husband was still going, uh, take, he was taking a college class. And in a Hawaiian college class, the professor was asking the question, what is it to be Hawaiian? You know, what is a Hawaiian? You know, you should ask my two-year-old, you know, she, she knew it already kind of a thing, you know. So I think that's a really important part that whatever they are, and in my case, as I said, my mom is pure German. I feel comfortable with my German culture as well. It's not necessarily what I identify with as far as how I want to live, but I know the history. I know the language. I, I love the food. <laughs> I, I have I have all kinds. Of, I, I still very close still with my um, German family and friends, you know, and I visit whenever I can. Um, I don't deny that part of my heritage. It's just not the part that I chose to live. You know, it's not the, the part that I chose to focus my research on the way I chose to, to, to teach my children. You know, the first priority was always Hawaiian. Is it, why don't you teach them German? Well, they, not, they know enough German to go to the store in Germany and order anything they want to eat, you know, kind of thing, which is the basic thing. But their identity for me was, for them to learn how to speak Hawaiian because there's lots of people that speak German, but there was hardly anybody that spoke Hawaiian when they, you know, when they were born in the early 90s. So that self-identity, I think, is really, really important because once you know who you are, then it's very hard for anybody else to shake that, right, kind of thing. If you have every reason to be proud of who you are, and I strongly believe every single person in the world, no matter who they are, has a good reason to be proud of who they are. All of us have times in our history that wasn't basically our greatest moments, right? All of us in every culture, in every uh, nationality, in every you know um, race, there were people that did horrible things, but there was also people who did good things, right? And if we focus on those who did good things, you know, and say that's our role models, no matter where we come from, that's a really important part for this for the, our children to have a really strong sense of that self identity, okay? because then we don't even get hurt by the racism in the first place, right? And then we don't have to heal from it either. So I think that is a really really important component. Another thing that uh, uh, Elisabetta kind of uh, mentioned that I want to talk a little bit more is about environment and land, taking our kids out into the environment. 
because the environment does not discriminate. They don't care how white you are, how black you are, how fat you are, how skinny you are, how much, what, what your IQ is, um, you know, whether you have any kind of physical handicap or anything else. The aina, which in Hawaiian means the entire environment, will treat you with aloha. And if you plant a seed with aloha, the aina will, will make that seed come out and grow with aloha. There is, there is no discrimination. And so that's why for me as an educator, when we started Kanuka Aina, uh, Hawaiian Focus Charter School in Waimea in 2000, our model was 50% in the environment and 50% in the classroom, because during those 50%, in the environment, we knew for sure that the children would not be discriminated with. And in our case, we had 80% Hawaiians, and then maybe 10% pure haole, and then the other 10% mix, you know. And, and again, haole not being a bad word, it just means Caucasian in, in my vocabulary. Um, and and everybody, you know, it didn't matter who planted that, that, that huli or who planted that Ulu tree or whatever it was, the Aina responded the same way to everybody kind of thing. And, and so being out in the environment and having the children have those experiences is a really important and a very productive way of, um, of giving them feedback that is completely void of any kind of racism or other isms that our children experience so much you know, in terms of whether it's the color of their skin, whether it's how, how many teeth they have or don't have, you know, whether it's how well they're dressed or not, you know, all of those things can, can definitely influence how they're treated by teachers in the classroom. But once they go into the environment, none of those things matter. You know, none of those things matter. Um, the other part for us was also to always frame everybody as special, but also everybody as gifted and talented. So 100% inclusion where everybody has special needs. There's not one kid in this world that doesn't have some special need that the next kid, even, even twin or sibling has or doesn't have. You know, there's always, every child is unique. And at the same time, every child has gifts and talents. Now in the Western education system, it's pretty much math, science and language arts, that's the only things you're gifted and talented in, right? But being gifted in surfing, being gifted in horseback riding, being gifted in, in dancing, you know, being gifted in chanting, being gifted in just whatever else you want to name it, you know, kind of a thing. Having opportunities for kids to, within a classroom setting, within a school setting, to display those gifts and talents. So it's not just academics and sports, and maybe art, but hardly, right? Because that's been washed totally under the rug. Um, but certainly sports and, and academics being, being looked at as the only gifts, you know, giving students that have other gifts an opportunity to also uh, exhibit those gifts and, and, and get grades for it and get accolades for that because all that builds up again, their self-identity and their self-esteem. And I think that's probably the most important part um, to combat the, the, the racism that, that is all around them, you know, whether we like it or not. Yes, well, thank you very much. It's, it's very important for all of us, um, even with, um, you know, different organization, even leaders in, in government, um, the different departments and to look at, you know, the education with culture and language is a very important um, aspect of child development. Um, when we, um, I want to share that, you know, when I was approached by several um, Chuk, Chuk leaders in, um, in the Waipahu, Waipahu area, since that's where our programs are, you know, dominantly at, at this time in Hawaii, here on Oahu, when I was approached by several um, adults and leaders there and asked, how do we start a program like what you're doing, Peta? I, you know, with open arms, you know, I am, I actually, I was so happy that they asked the question. 
Of course, I learned a lot of this from, you know, the Hawaiian community. When I moved here in Hawaii and raised my children, I have seen the, how they thrive through their language, language and culture. And it really, um, I've seen the empowerment within them. And Kuka Kalau was a, a mentor to me as a, as a leader as well in my own community. So sharing the knowledge between each cultures, you know, the different cultures is very important. And when I was approached by the Chuk community, I, I actually invited all of them to, to come and sit in our lessons and learn Samoan. Because I was, in my mind, I was thinking, what is the best way for me to share um, the knowledge that I have, to share the strategies that we have as a community-based program? Of course, inclusiveness having them to sit in in our lessons and um, learn someone and you know they they sent over some of the adults um, community um, parents to sit in we even invited their children of course i don't know the chuk language but as they became more involved with our activities for over three years they knew exactly what to do they came in with their own skills and there was one time um, you know, we registered over 10 Chuk students in our Samoan language during the summer. We were so proud. You, I did not, as a teacher and, and the leader in that, that classroom, I did not see any racism in that classroom. It was a, a really great learning environment of children working together. And of course, as a teacher, you discuss, you know, what's expected of the kids. So as you know, what, you know, there was one time that we had to work on um, developing alphabet books. You know, we, you know, as a teacher, cooperative learning was one of the strategies that we used where you mix all the children in the classroom where some of the Samoan students work together with the Chuk students and of course, um, you know, throughout the whole class. So building that positive learning environment is very important. And even as a teacher, you have to think creatively, what are some of the strategies that you have to utilize in the classroom? So it, you know, that there is no sense of racism. There is no sense of discussing any of that. The focus of having them being inclusive in the classroom was to learn, to um, actually get the product, you know, because they had, they, they, they have to showcase the final, um, you know, product of, of, of their lesson to, um, you know, as a culmination to the parents at the end of, the, of our summer program. That implementation really, um, opened up a lot of ideas in our minds. And even for myself as a leader, when I saw um, how, you know, how the children worked well with each other, I knew that we want to have this type of, of, of learning environment. So even with our Samoan um, program, it's not just for Samoans. We, uh, we had several participants that are, you know, members of the community that they've worked with someone, someone um, co-workers who wanted to learn the language. And they would always say, oh, my friends would always speak Samoan, but I want to learn, I want to understand. So, you know, those types of um, inclusiveness in terms of, of, of approaches and, you know, having the Chuk community to learn from the Samoan, our Lefetua Samoan program really helped them develop their own, um, you know, heritage language project. Now they have a, a Chuk language program for, for the community. So, so there are times when we, um, you know, before COVID, we would include the children to visit some of the, the chip programs at, at the Waipahu Plantation um, Village. So, you know, I, 
I always think that, you know, it, I wish the Department of Education or even our leaders um, can, can um, invest more to develop spaces like these, to have programs for the children. Of course, you know, we have a public school system, but the question is, do we have space to help children of, you know, the children of, of someone to, to learn about their language and their culture? Um, you know, we have, you know, other languages. So when, I, when we took our teachers to New Zealand, was part of our Lefetua um, program implementation. We saw, you know, one of the program called Punana Leo, which is a preschool. We would go to Tokelauan language. We would go to, there was another classroom for the, for Tonga, Tonga, another for Samoan. You know, it really opened my eyes to think about the approaches. And it's beautiful when we would um, take the teachers, our Samoan teachers to um, some of the Hawaiian language um, implementation. So even developing teacher training um, spaces, very important. I wish that we have that, you know, um, approach here in, in the state of Hawaii, because some of our some of our teachers are not comfortable teaching our own language, teaching our own culture, because they don't have that exposure, they don't have that training space, and Hawaii is such a beautiful, diverse community where. Um, they they develop a, a really a wonderful system that they that we can also include you know spaces for 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 teacher training. So yes, it's something that I want to share. <laughs> no, that's that's a that's a great point, and it's so wonderful to hear how um, the knowledge has been passed from from culture to culture to develop this really. Um, diverse and inclusive sort of network of, of programs, even on the grassroots level. And, and certainly we can we can hope for more, more public investment as well. Um, you know, we have about 10 minutes left and I, um, I did wanna ask um, one thing that, that has been coming up a lot. Um, so, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, kids might have, might have questions about current events, might have questions about for example, why people like them are depicted in, in in movies and TV the way they are. They're like, you know, that's not why. Why does it look like that? Or or maybe they hear in the news, you know, about the police shootings, you know, of people of color, even in our own state, and they wonder, you know, why why did that happen? You know, and they they might think um, because even young children know that race exists, you know, and race is part of life. They might think that race had something to do with it. So, so how do you, um, what tips, I guess, would you have for parents who, you know, might be having these types of conversations with their own kids? Well, I think one of the things is really modeling things, right? So whatever, um, whatever we say about other races is something that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that, that, that then we teach our children, uh, but it's also what we do, you know, so when we have friends, you know, we're of of every background, you know, and we and we and we we acknowledge them as our friends, and and we we share with our children how we love this person, you know, how how they are smart in this way, and how they have all these wonderful things to give. I think that is a really important part already, just to set the the setting that that it because if if they live like let's say in Hawaii. And there are, you know, a significant amount of Samoans and Tongans and other Polynesians, but you as a Hawaiian don't have any of friends that are any of those things or Micronesians, right? Micronesians right now, I think are one of our more discriminated against the, for various reasons. None of them, you know, necessarily their own or certainly not the individual person's, you know, uh, fault, let's put it that way. But if we, you know, if we see somebody in the store that's Micronesian and, and we do something special to be nice and courteous and friendly to them, 
Um, little things like that uh, is the first part. I think that's that's because you can't talk about stuff if you didn't act it all this time, right? That's the important because kids are also smart about that, right? You can't give them some philosophical explanations about race and stuff. And then you go out and you see a, you know, whatever color it is and you don't hold the door open, but you would hold it open for somebody else, right? Or you don't pick up something if, it, if they dropped it, you know, but you would do it for somebody else, right? But if they see that no matter who it is, you know, that you have a smile for them, that you have aloha for them, that you greet them, you know, just like you would greet your own race, you know, type of thing or your own ethnicity. I think that's the first part. And then when it comes out, you know, then just talk about that. And and, and to be very honest, you know, tell, yeah, look, um, you know, it happens because, um, you know, when we look at the statistics, clearly in Hawaii, if you're a brown person, you have a lot of a higher incident of getting arrested, of getting longer jail service, of getting shot. Or I mean, that, this is not something we're dreaming up. We have the data to show all of that. And not just five years of data, but as long as data has been collected, you know, the evidence has been there that there is definitely a, an issue as far as, um, you know, the color is concerned. And explaining it to them, you know, I think that's the only thing you can do is just explain and say, you know, um, explain the history, you know, well, at one point there were only Hawaiians here and then other people came and they took away a lot of things from us, you know, uh, because that's what they wanted, you know, and for a long time they were able to take over and, and do things that weren't right, you know, but that doesn't mean every person of that color is that way. Look, for example, there's so-and-so, like your friend, your grandma, your somebody, you know, and remember how nice they are, you know, so so it's not that everybody is like that and there's greedy people, you know, and there's mean people in, in every race and just talk about it really openly and honestly with them. I wouldn't whitewash anything. I wouldn't try to minimize this at the same time. Also, I am not for children watching news. Uh, I'm not for them watching any of this violent stuff, you know, that's happening. Um, I don't think they need to be get any more negative <laughs> crap that they're already exposed to, you know what I mean, in, in real life. So I am not in favor of them watching anything that is that is um, derogatory towards anybody, towards any race. Um, and, and when I see them, like when it's, when it's um, news, first of all, or if it's a documentary or if it's movies that are too violent and you clearly see that they are racial, you know, they, they, there's race and, and race problems in those movies. I don't let them watch any of that, you know, that until they're old enough to make their own decision, as long as I control the remote, they're not watching any of that, you know, because to me, that's not something, that's something that's going to confuse them. That's something that's going to affect them some more, some less, but I don't even want to put them in that situation, you know, um, and just and and so I think that's also an important part in my book is is to to eliminate as much as you can. You're not going to be able to erase it, but to to eliminate as much as possible um, overt racial situations, you know, um, and uh, so that they don't even have to deal with those kind of questions. But I think the most important part for us as parents is to show aloha, you know. And when we show aloha and aloha is an, a, an unconditional thing, right? It's not predicated on color or size or beauty or, you know, IQ or whatever, you know, it, it, it is an honest emotion that we share with the next person because they are, you know, just another human being just like us and they deserve that aloha kind of thing, right? As, and as we dish it out, you know, it's gonna come back, maybe not always from the same person, but, they see in the long run that aloha is reciprocated in a very karma, whatever you want to call it, kind of a way, you know, and in Hawaiian, our language and in Samoan too, it's aloha atu, aloha mai, aloha aku, aloha mai. It's the same idea, you know, we give love and we receive love. I think one thing that, that's been something very special about Hawaii is that because of our long separation with everybody else prior to Western contact, we never had the concept of other. And in the absence of this concept of other, because everybody else had an other, 
or the next island or over the mountain down the river. We never had that. Everybody was Ohana. You might hate your sister, but that's still your sister kind of thing, or your cousin. You might want to kick them all around, whatever, but that's still your cousin. So we were all family. We really looked at ourselves as one family as much as we would to have our own infighting. You know, it wasn't a perfect society or anything, but we never had the concept of other that somebody was less than us. And that's why I feel as Hawaiians, we have this concept of aloha that we are have since first Western contact have shared with others, you know, about this, this unconditional love and kindness and compassion towards others. It's very important for all of us to, um, you know, to choose love over hate. I think that's very important, like how Dr. Kakalao had mentioned, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a term that we are using, we're using all the time. Choose aloha. We live in Hawaii, we live with aloha. So how do we carry that forward? It's very important for us to embrace that, um, encourage our children to have that mindset, as well as us parents. Um, I think, um, you know, sometimes as, you know, when we have issues, in the community, for example, the you know the, the issue with the police as well as the, our Micronesian community. Um, when we think about it, we you know we cannot erase some of what's shared in media, the media, the the, the political tension and even the racial tensions that's going on. So I know I asked the question before I came on board. I asked my son who is 17 years old um, and it echoes what Kakalao had mentioned. And I'm so glad that, you know, he, 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 his mindset equates to someone that is so great in the Hawaiian community. He had mentioned avoid social media. He immediately said that. I think he understood. And, and my son as a junior in high school, um, whenever there, you know, he loves his grandma who takes care of grandma, who would never go anywhere if no one is looking after grandma. Um, you know, I always think that when we choose love over hate, we can avoid all of these issues that we have. It all comes down to our ohana, our family very important for us to instill the positiveness and also the love in our family. You know, the language that you use in the homes, even if there's hate in the home, that's the reflection of what the children will, will have in public. I think for all of us to embrace love in the family, in our ohana, it can be transferred out in the community. Um, like I always shared, like when when I was um, given the um, the privilege, the, the the opportunity to share about the the award with H Can, I used that very important um, you know proverbial expression. And my mother, who is seventy five years old, uh, had mentioned, you know, when you use if a four leala mea leala mea. It's it, it, it talks about when when they when you're hurt, when you're hurt. So, you know, the starfish, the, the you know, the idea of 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 having its own um, healing mechanism. When when you're hurt, you choose love to get rid of that hurt, to take away that hurt from yourself. So, you know, why why it's very important for us, like what who had mentioned. The empowerment within our community is very crucial. How do we empower? We, we embrace, we also provide the positiveness within the, you know, the community. And, and I think um, role modeling is also very important within the Micronesian society. One of the best stories I always have to share, look at the hokulea. You know, the navigation, one of the best navigators in, in, in the Pacific are the Micronesians. That's one of the top stories I always share with 
you know, with children when I speak about storytelling in, in the classroom. I think when they hear more empowerment from history, from our ancestors, it helps them to feel that love of acceptance and being inclusive in the, in, in the community. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, you both have, have given us so much to think about um, this hour and, and I, could, I could listen to you both for, for the whole night, honestly, talking about this. There's, there's so much to learn from you both. Um, I did just wanna ask, you know, if there's any um, last words or any any like practical tips or, or resources that you want to direct any of the parents or anyone listening, you know, direct them to and, and have them check out if they want to learn more. Um, well, I, I would like to point everybody to our Olelo no Eao, which is a book of Hawaiian proverbs and poetical sayings. You can get it for as an ebook for 1995 from Bishop Museum Press. Uh, I really mean, uh, I, I don't get paid for this advertisement, but for me, it's, it's the philosophy of our ancestors. And there are so many, the proverbial expressions that Peta just talked about, you know, uh, we all have them in our own cultures. And I think many, many of them, regardless of, of what culture, and I, uh, my German grandma used as many proverbs as my Hawaiian grandpa, you know, as far as that, there's so much wisdom in there. And so uh, Hawaii, Olelo no Eau, Hawaiian Proverbs and Poetical Sayings by Mary Kawena Pukui um, uh, from Bishop Museum Press, um, downloadable as an ebook. Um, and one, and the one that I would like to leave everybody with is Waola Loko Ike Aloha. Waola Loko Ike Aloha means love gives life within. And you know, and, and being affected by racism, um, takes away life, right? It, it takes away our health, it takes away our spirit, yeah, right, kind of a thing. But aloha gives us life again. So echoing what, uh, uh, what Peta said, you know, um, by practicing aloha, by sharing aloha, by living aloha, we, will, we can heal from, from racism. We can uh, stop being affect, affected by it and uh, being traumatized buy it. And so really to us, to me as a Hawaiian, the answer is aloha. But I think for all people in the world, ultimately the answer is aloha. And no matter what world religions you look at, you know, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's uh, Islam, you know, all of them speak to this power of love, right? The highest thing being love, the most precious thing being love. And I think we in Hawaii, we are very fortunate at our kupuna because of that separation and that lack of other, we're able to really develop this concept of aloha and share it with others. And so it is something that we welcome everybody to take on at the same time, knowing that all around the world, Aloha is practice, right? This is, it's not a, only a Hawaiian thing, but it's just that we maybe were able to elevate it a little bit higher because of this unique situation of being separated so far, thousands of miles from everybody else. Um, but there's not one place in the world that where there are people without Aloha, right? Everybody has it, it's infinite. Um, it, it, it never runs out. And most of all, it's what we call in Hawaiian manuahi, it's free. It doesn't cost one cent, you know, and if we would go into a pedagogy of aloha within the DOE, which would be completely free, right, they wouldn't cost them one cent to transition to a pedagogy of aloha, I think our children would be doing so much better. And whenever this ugly racism rears its, its very, very ugly head, you know, they would not be affected by it. So that's that's what, and thank you for inviting me tonight, and Mahalo Nui Peta for sharing this this beautiful uh, space and time with you. Yes, and you know I, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity as well to share. I think it's very important for all of us to embrace love in our community, as we always say, life is so precious, and you know to have life is to enjoy life with love and aloha. Um, you know, some of the tools that we use as parents, find time um, during the week 
and spend time with, with the children. A lot of times when, um, you know, when there is so much tension in the home, if there's an issue of a, a family funeral, you know, my husband and I would always find time to have a drive, maybe over at the museum, even find space where there's a garden to sit around and relax, or even at the beach. Um, a lot of our local families enjoy being outside. I think it's very important for us to know that you know the healing method mechanism or the healing method for all of us is to find that time and to and to um, enjoy the, the the atmosphere or the community that we have here in Hawaii to um, share with our children. Uh, what more can you give but love to the keikis? So thank you very much for um, allowing us to, to share with you all. Yeah, thank you again, both of you, for such, such wise words and, and so much to reflect on tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Zoe to, to wrap this up. Yeah, like Ryan said, thank you so much, Pooh and uh, Elisabeth, for your time, um, for sharing your thoughts and all of your experiences. We appreciate that so much. Um, and a huge thank you to everyone who showed up today and joined us. Uh, like Ryan mentioned at the beginning, uh, the recording will be shared around after this, and there is going to be a... Um, replay in the morning that will happen at 7 a.m. That is going to go on our Facebook page. If you know someone that wanted to see it and didn't get to, um, it will be replayed there. And then lastly, we wanted to personally invite you guys to check out our next event. We're having a documentary screening of Starting at Zero. Um, you will just uh, register and then you'll get a link that'll be active. You can watch it anytime uh, between August 13th and 15th. Um, the film is an hour long, roughly, and there's a panelist at the beginning and end of it as well, which is kind of cool to get to uh, hear their experiences. Um, but the film just explores uh, early childhood education um, and making sure that we have investments in high quality education for these children and then it kind of dives into an example um, in Alabama so it's a really good film um, and we hope that we can see you guys there as well thanks again everyone okay yeah so fast <laughs> aloha aloha